looked around and said, no, we want to know what's going on in the world. We're interested in the world. And somehow Canadian plays seems kind of parochial, just really local, just really not very good. It's all like the CBC, yuck. Uh, so, so people started looking for international stories and, uh, and taking, I mean, I'm being very broad here, but I'm trying to just, I'm trying to grapple with the audience member here mm-hmm. who, who and, and I'm trying to grapple with why uh, Soul Pepper is so successful and why there is an audience for Sing Kill and why there is an audience for Obsidian and for De Kink in My Hair, why that was so successful and why we don't see plays from the Prairie Theatre Exchange in Toronto anymore or plays from out west in Toronto anymore. What? I was just going to say that I think I'm approaching it a, a, a little bit differently in that um, the work we do is inherently political uh, and uh, that's important to me and that's why it's on the stage. Um, so I feel like uh, the work that we do reflects uh, me and the people and my staff and the people that work with me. Um, and. Uh, a really good example, and, and we didn't know this was happening, but this whole year, or this current season, we, we uh, programmed, our first show of the year was a, uh, a visual art exhibit called Condo Boom. The second show, which looked at the rise of condos and condo culture, not only in Toronto, which in our area, which is where we're, we're in Queen West, there's this huge booming condo land happening there with thousands of new people coming in. So we weren't taking a negative stance on it. We were just saying, let's look at the phenomena. And so we invited a, an artist from Tokyo to come in and interview people on Queen West in the streets. Uh, we exhibited uh, a really amazing, massive photographs from an artist uh, from uh, Shanghai. Um, and we worked uh, with, with New York, uh, a group in New York, uh, this, and this, the Center for Urban Pedagogy. So what we, what, and sorry, I'll just continue, I'm rambling. But the second, the, the second piece we worked with Native Earth um, on was a piece called Ukwak, the shelter, um, and it was a piece by a, a, a Quebecois a dancer and a filmmaker storyteller from Nunavut. And this was a piece about the, their union and themselves trying to understand uh, what it meant to make a home for themselves because they're coming from two different cultures. The, we commissioned a work by a Montreal company called ATSA. Uh, they have a history of doing work with uh, homeless, uh, homeless people and the street involved culture in Montreal. We invited them to Toronto the first time they've been out of Montre- Montreal doing a major project and they're investigating Toronto and how Toronto deals with street involved uh, people. Um, and so we thought, oh my God, our whole season is about homelessness. It's about not having a home. And then I thought about where we were at personally. Well, uh, the theater center had just been kicked out of its of its space again. I mean, <laughs> we're still there, but we're you know no lease or anything. We're month to month, day by day, um, and I just bought a condo. <laughs> Kathy uh, uh, was couch surfing for a year and a half until about six months ago when she uh, rented an apartment finally because she said I'm staying in Toronto. And Jennifer Tarver um, sold her house because they had termites. So, and I'm thinking, there's a connection here, you know, and it's on, it's, it's on a different level, but there is still a connection about, of, of the things that we program come from us. And I feel like that's, that's where, and we have found an audience. You know, we have found an audience, it's small, and, but that's, and that's good for me, like that's okay for me, because I think that, again, it sort of goes with that's, 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 our, that's what our role is, is that the incubator, the beginnings uh, of, of, uh, of the idea. And I think there's no shortage of ideas. And also, I just want to say that I related to Sing Kill, you know? Uh, I didn't have to be Filipino to relate to it. Did someone hide a chicken hat under your bed? 
<laughs> is that was that the link? <laughs> Don't answer that, Franco. Do you guys? Or is there? I see one back there. Let's, <laughs> let's talk to you guys for a bit. I said we would. Sally, oh, is that you? Yeah. Um, there's so much to be said about this whole thing and about niche programming, about mixing audiences, and I'll jump from the comments I wanted to make earlier to um, a realization I just had, where it's the people who are worried about diversifying the audiences are always the ones with the big marketing budgets. And those of us who don't have diverse audiences but who have niche audiences don't have any marketing money to play with at all to bring in the wider audience. But that just came to my mind listening to you talk. One of the things is the niche audience is, is I mean, people are finally getting it, that people go to theater to see themselves on stage. I mean, Shakespeare's been telling us, as everybody's been telling us since time immemorial, you know, the stage is a mirror, right? So people are finally getting that. And I don't think we will have mixed audiences. Uh, Russ and Guards, 89% of our audience is South Asian. Um, Stefan aside, I don't believe any person in this room, maybe Michael, has ever been to a Russ and Guards production. All the people crying diversity, they won't come and see a South Asian play done by South Asian actors. Hmm. Isn't that funny? And we don't end up big marketing budget or anything like Well, Bombay Black yeah, played at the, the theater Bombay center, Black. and it was like a, it was it was it was huge. I mean, there was a huge South yeah. Asian community yeah. that came to see it, but there was absolutely a very mixed uh, a, a mixed audience. Cahoots has a much higher profile and has been around much longer, right. and they had a very right. high South Asian content. And you know, who promoted it was on their email list was Bombay Black. Uh, who? Oh, okay. okay. Um, I just. Uh, no, what I'm saying is, I'm saying is, until the bigger budget mainstream houses, because like 15 years ago, I went. A friend of mine wanted a ticket to Can stage on the radio, so I went. And I, what was it? 15 years ago, it was six degrees of separation, or whatever that play mm -hmm. was. And I sat in the seat of Steve, and I went, Oh my God, it's a bunch of white people sitting around on stage, and a bunch of white people sitting around listening to them, even though there was a black character. And it was all people yeah. um, I'm becoming like really aware that, yeah. People on stage, no matter what the story, until you have mixed casts, and the stories are compelling stories to anyone. Yeah. Can, I, can I jump in and just say one thing that I didn't mention before? Audiences. Yeah. I just Go want to jump in really, really quickly. I just say that one of the next pieces that we're working on, we're launching it at Nuit Blanche, is a show, it's a, a show that's not even really, it, there'll be a live component of it, but all of it happens online. Uh, so we don't even know who our audience is gonna be. I mean, I guess we could check the stats. Uh, question becomes, how the heck do we make any money off this show that's online? But that, uh, and, you know, maybe that's our responsibility, but again, it's questioning of like, uh, who, who is, who's gonna be the audience for this? Like, who's gonna click in and see this? I mean. I will. Well, I just want to really quickly restate something that Sally said, which was interesting to me, which was that when we speak about diversifying audiences, we are usually talking about bigger companies with a larger marketing budget trying to bring niche audiences in, as opposed to what Sally's experience is more like, which is being a niche company trying to bring in the mainstream audience. Is that, was, uh, is that fairly accurate? Yeah. I found that, that to be very interesting. And I'm sorry to hold you up, you had a point. Good. Um, I was just going to say that I think that when you ask the question about um, when we say people want to see themselves on stage, I would say that is probably initially true, but we work in the theater, and one would assume that theater bridges those gaps between people. I have often gone to plays where people on that stage were not, it wasn't, you know, it was a gay quadriplegic, I don't know, you know, I mean, that, sorry if that offended me, but, I mean, but that's not my experience, but there were things innate in the story that were exactly my experience, and I would like to think that when we talk about diversity as a marketing vehicle, as a way to get more people into the, into our, into the theater generally for all of us, that there's got to be an understanding that the art, very art form we work in 
I believe I work in it because I believe that it, it bridges those gaps. So there are ways of finding commonalities. I'm not trying to be Pollyanna about it. And at the same time, I think that bringing new audiences, when we talk about new audiences, we ought to always immediately talk about diverse audiences. Like if because our theaters are empty, we better bring people of color in. But we don't think <laughs> that when our theaters are full. And that to me is a real concern. I work for Kent Stage. I work for the big pig organization also. And I think that, you know, also we, you know, we did three black plays in a row. Well, we didn't have people of color come to our audience, yet come to, our, come to those shows significantly. The numbers of people of color that came to see Crowns and <coughs> Cooking at the Cookery didn't significantly alter the, the demographic of our audience. But I think that has to do with the way we speak to people, how welcome people feel in that space. You know, what's the perception of this company that's producing this particular play in this particular time? So I think there's a lot of factors that come into the way we create and communicate the work that we do and how we communicate it to people. Yes, which I, is as important. I just uh, I have to jump in there for a moment because I'm having an epiphany yeah. here, <laughs> and I me, need to share that with it. Um, <laughs> yes, because me, as a little uh, half breed Indian kid in Winnipeg, the theater I'm seeing for the for the, the, all of the growing up does not reflect me at all, at all, at all. Right, but the but there are seminal moments, plays in my growing up in Winnipeg that have, that, that for some reason speak to me. Um, even though I'm not, like, I think, I think right now of the production of Bent that I saw by Martin Sherman that kept me in theater for an, another 10 years um, when all was lost until Native Earth came to town and I was like, oh, there is a Native theater company, like, which was kind of amazing to me. But my hook into theater is not, does not reflect my experience, like my particular Aboriginal Irish half breed experience. If there's something else, but at some point, I got tired of, no, of only seeing the white folks on stage. I'm s tired of it now. I'm tired of, of, of not reflecting. And, and the place where, there, where it was reflected, it wasn't theater for young audience, because they always, they were way ahead of everyone else in terms of casting, just casting, and the ballet, ironically enough, because the ballet has always been filled with people from other countries dancing. Asian dancers, Chinese dancers, black dancers, the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, and and those people, it was there's and opera too. Once I started going to opera, like there's no, it is more colorblind. So I don't know why we can't do that. Okay, I saw another yeah. hand. And actually, uh, is there any way that I can just add on to Patty? Sure. Patty's, um, yeah. And it's funny what you're saying that you know there might be diversity on stage, but not necessarily in the audiences. And that's definitely one of the things that I had to deal with at Factory because they had a very strong core. Um, of, of supporters for Factory, but most of them were Caucasian. Um, but the problem is that you know they, they had the diversity on stage. It's just that it was a matter of getting those audiences to in so that they would see that they were those stories were on stage. Um, so what I I felt was is that. Um, and that's why outreach to me doesn't cost a lot of money. And I think that every, uh, it, it's a lot of it is um, the biggest investment is the uh, person, the outreach person who has to uh, be the person to do it. It's not necessarily money to create a marketing campaign. Actually, a, a lot of the times I find that ads and you know like uh, flyers and stuff like that don't really work when it comes to uh, dealing with diverse audiences. Is that I had to invest the time speaking to these people, establishing a community uh, representative who can give me the lowdown as to what what may attract certain communities, and um, yeah, speaking like attending their events and really gaining their trust. Um, uh, to, on an ongoing basis in order for them to come in to see a show that will connect to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it, I totally agree with you that it is um, about, it's, it's, it's not necessarily just making the show and saying, okay, it's here. It's, it's more like you really have to meet with these people because, um, um, for example, the, uh, when I was meeting with the black community, for example, for The Real McCoy, who may connect to Obsidian Theatre, for example, um, I wanted to make sure that they knew that The Real McCoy was playing during Black History Month, and that there was, it was a story, a wonderful story, that will make them come out of the theatre going, yes, it was a black Canadian who revolutionized the steam in industry, like, that's what I wanted. And so, um, 
uh, yeah, I, I needed them to feel comfortable with us, to know who, like the people behind the show and to, to get to know the playwright and stuff. And it took a lot of work of just gaining that kind of trust. Um, so yeah, it, it's um, outreach, it, it's so, so much more of an investment in time.